Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast, where we explore your hidden thoughts and desires, revealing your greatest drop the mic moments. Now, here's your host, Art Costello. Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast. Today, I am honored and thrilled to have Nikki Barua on our show. She is a serial entrepreneur. She is the founder of Beyond Barriers, a global leadership platform that helps women gain momentum with adaptive strategies, digital age skills, access to resources, and peer accountability. She is also the founder of Beyond Curious, an award-winning digital motivation agency that partners with large companies to unlock innovation with agile processes, design thinking, and diverse cultures. She's received numerous awards, including Entrepreneur of the Year by ACE, named as a EY North American Entrepreneur winning woman, recognized by LA Women of Influence and by Business Journal and Women's Entrepreneurship by LA Lakers and Co. America Banking. Her story of turning barriers into breakthroughs has been featured in national media, including Fortune and Forbes. Her successes have given her a global platform of influence and fierce advocacy for diversity. As a thought leader and expert, she's passionate about making the world more inclusive and innovative. She graduated with three master's degrees and is a deeply curious person, a lifelong learner, fluent in five languages, and she speaks from her heart in all of them. She believes we are all limitless and lead life by committed to going beyond barriers. Nikki, honored to have you here. You're a new friend. We met at the New Media Summit, and I instantly knew that you were special. And I want you to tell our audience your story. Thanks for having me on the show, Art. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, it is a real honor. So where did it all start for you? Well, my story began with a collage. I was a little girl growing up in India. It was a time when there wasn't a lot of visible role models back then. And so as a young girl, I was looking for inspiration. And my father did something really, really special that shaped my imagination and really shaped my life. He created a collage on the inside of my closet door. And in this collage, he had pictures of inspiring female role models, you know, powerful women leaders like Indira Gandhi and Margaret Thatcher and Amelia Earhart. And so he had all these newspaper and magazine cuttings of their pictures, you know, their faces. And he created this collage. And in the center of that collage, he took a sheet of paper and he sketched out my face. So I was right in the center of all these incredible women, and he never said a word about it to me. He, he didn't say, hey, I want you to grow up to be like them, or you know, this is what you can be. He just kept adding to these pictures. And so every day when I would open my closet door, I would look at this collage, and all I thought was, they're my friends. I'm just like them. I belong amongst these women. And that collage has been imprinted in my mind ever since. And I've been fortunate to grow up with that inspiration, believing truly that we are all limitless, that we're all leaders, and our reason for being is to create impact in the world. The need to have closure in any given situation is sheer human nature. And when it comes to romantic relationships, this desire skyrockets. Has your previously failed relationship left you in immense pain? It's not uncommon for people to shy away from a new relationship after their first one fails miserably. The fear of the unknown makes them hide in a shell to prevent any future heartbreak. Relatable? Despite wanting to love and be loved, you can't take the plunge if your mind and heart are still locked somewhere in the past. Maybe you aren't aware of the power of releasing the past, or perhaps you don't know how to do it. Art Costello in his online course teaches the art of moving on from bad places to happier, more stable ones. This course can change your life for good, helping you beat all kinds of negativity on the road to eternal bliss. Sign up now before the gloominess gets the better of you at expectationacademy.com. So your father set the expectation of your greatness by putting a collage up with you in the center of all these great women. That is really 
so inspirational and such, I mean, all the moms listening and dads listening out there, do that for your kids. I mean, create that for them so they believe in themselves because that's where it starts, right? Believing in yourself. Yes, I think the image we create of ourselves, of the possibilities of who we can be, oftentimes sets us up for who we become. And at a young age, you know, we grow up with sort of a blank slate in many ways. And then so it's so important of the images that get imprinted in our minds of the possibilities that we can create. You know, my father gave me this incredible gift without setting an expectation that that's the only way for me to be. He gave me a possibility and one that I accepted. On the flip side of it, though, at some point in my life, I also realized that you have to make it who you are meant to be as opposed to becoming like someone else in that picture. (laughs) And, you know, it became a blessing and a curse. On one end, it was a blessing to have that kind of vision that someone framed for me. On the other hand, you have to be mindful that it doesn't become a comparison because comparison is a prison. When you start to believe that the only way you can be significant or have a meaningful life is to be like someone else in that collage, it can create an expectation that if you're not living up to those standards, that your life doesn't have meaning or that you don't have any sort of significance in that. So to learn to run your own race to be the best version of yourself is the ultimate takeaway that you know my life has unfolded and taught me. That's what, one of the reasons why I think that when we live to the expectations of others, it's very inhibiting. But when we live to the expectations that we have in our core, that when you talk about that blank slate, you know, we add to that blank slate every day that we're alive. New things come in and we learn who we are, but you have to have the expectation to be true to who you are. If you don't live with that, then we succumb to the expectations of others. And that's what causes so much problems for people. The other thing you said that that touched my heart is I believe one of my mantras is I believe in the possibility of everything. Yes. Limitless possibilities. And I love that about you because I know we'll hear it in your story about what you've accomplished. But when you believe limitlessly and you're open-minded to everything. What I have learned, and I'm continuing to learn this, is there is no fixed definition of who we are. You know, life is happening for us, but it's also who we are becoming every day. I think the power is in the (laughs) I-N-G of who we are continuing to become each and every single day that we are shaped by the environment around us, but also by the expectations within us. And that's what creates the possibilities when you, in many ways, allow that to bring out the best in you it becomes an adventure of the person you continue to become each day. I agree wholeheartedly because I believe that learning is the, and I'm talking about life learning. Mm -hmm. Life learning is the greatest teacher we have and and it really does dictate who we become. And that's why I said about being closed minded, you limit what you learn when you shut out the possibility of everything. You know, we're actually trained at least in the United States Colleges, universities, high schools, middle school, even elementary schools now are so focused in what they teach instead of how they teach Mm -hmm. and teaching kids how to learn the possibilities of everything. They teach them all these specifics and then they think they have to go to college to become the president of a corporation or anything like this. And in actuality, you don't really need any of that as long as you're open to learning and committing yourself to, I call it avid reading and and all kinds of things that really change our perspective on the world. Yeah. As we take in all these external influences and our own reaction to that stimulus, if you will, oftentimes dictates the expectations we create for ourselves. And so for me, that collage was such an influential vision. And yet there was a part of me that sort of my takeaway was that I had to be this young overachiever. 
<laughs> because I'm surrounded in this collage by all these incredible women that had created massive impact at a young age and had achieved so much and had touched so many lives. So on one hand, I learned that we're all limitless and that we can do anything. I did not see barriers. I just saw possibilities. On the flip side, it also created an expectation that I had to achieve things very young and at a very large scale. So that puts a lot of pressure on you. So here I was, a young girl with big dreams, and I believed that America was the place where those dreams would come true. And so in 1997, I came to America with just a few hundred dollars in my pocket and a suitcase full of very unfashionable clothes. And How old were you? I was barely over 21 at the time. <laughs> and you know, I really left everything I knew back home and you know, just took a one-way ticket and came down here. And all I had was just one bag and all my big dreams. And, you know, it was a very exciting yet very scary time because I did not fit the mold. I was nothing like, you know, what the stereotype here was. So I was this, you know, poor immigrant, non-white female who's very short and really gay. <laughs> so, so, you know, I did not think I had a shot in hell of making it, you know, I mean, as much as you come here with all these big dreams and expectations and you arrive here and then you're like, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> I'm not like the rest of them. I'm going to disagree with you. <laughs> I'm going to disagree. I believe when you came here, maybe you didn't realize it, but in your psyche, there was success written all over it because of that collage. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I came here because there was an expectation of success, but there's also that fear, you know, it's sort of like faith and fear are opposite <laughs> sides of the same coin. So there was a part of me that had absolute faith that I was meant to go on this journey, that there was success that I, you know, believed in, uh, you know, that was possible for me. But on the other side was also the fear of what that journey could look like and that it was all alone. The sense of isolation was, you know, that's what filled me with fear. But I wasn't going to let all those fears or all those labels define me or hold there me There you go. There you go. Those words, I was not going to let fear take over me. And that is the difference between you and so many other young people in this country. They let things stop them because of that fear that, oh, what is everybody going to think? You didn't care about any of that. You were so focused on what you knew you could achieve. And really, your expectations were so honed and focused that you started creating this beautiful world that you've created. You know, I found a very simple formula for overcoming fear because I personally can say that I'm fearless. You know, I think it's human nature to feel fear. I, I believe we it all is. experience fear, but there's a difference between feeling fear and let it stop you dead in your tracks versus feeling fear and having something compelling on the other side of you that makes you get past it. So what has worked for me is I think of it as, you know, a bed of coals you know, live coals, there's a fire, and I'm standing on one side of it, filled with fear. And as long as there's something on the other side of it, that is so compelling, so powerful that I'm just drawn to it, I'm not going to focus on the fire, I'm going to focus on how I get to the other side. So you just need faith to be greater than fear. Exactly. I used to say that I was fearless. And I stopped saying it. When somebody proposed this to me, if you're fearless, would you walk across the Grand Canyon on a tightrope <laughs> without a net underneath you? And I said, no. Nope. And they said, you've got fear. Yeah. So I said, yeah. I said, but that's it. You know, I think that I'm entrepreneurially, entrepreneurially fearless because I have always gone after what I wanted entrepreneurially. Emotionally, I think I'm fearless. But when it comes to walking across the Grand Canyon, uh -uh, I'm not going to do it. So I have a fear. But overcoming it is what really matters. And I imagine if I took enough time and learned, and if I was a whole lot younger than 72, I could walk across that rope at some point in my life. I mean, I did in the Marine Corps, I did overhead things over rivers and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I overcame so many fears that I had as a 17-year-old when I went in. So 
I know I could overcome it. We can overcome anything that we want to. Yeah. And that's, that's the key. So there, go on with your story. Sorry. And some of it is also, you know, the more action you take, the easier it becomes to face that fear. Inertia is the worst thing you can do to overcome <laughs> the obstacles in your path. Because if you're standing still in one spot, you know, the fear starts to dominate and becomes overwhelming where you can't move at all. So what I tend to do is make a big problem smaller. So that that small little action that I can take just starts to get me out of paralysis into taking tiny little baby steps forward. And, you know, when you start to take step after step, that's where momentum is created. And then before you know it, you've stepped away from that fear. You've, you've overcome that. So it, it was the same thing that I experienced when I came to America as this young immigrant, because I did not know how to drive on the wrong side of the road. I did not know how to use a washer dryer. I didn't know how to cook. I, I literally did not know. I mean, I couldn't tell the difference between uh, a penny, a nickel, and a dime. I mean, it's scary where everything you know or you've ever known in your life becomes irrelevant in an instant. And it's a whole new paradigm shift. And you have to learn. It's almost like coming, it's like being a toddler, right? For the first time, you're learning new steps. You're learning a new language. You're learning a new way of being. And in that, you're shaping a new identity for yourself. So it's a period of becoming. You know. So for me, that period was at the same time exciting and yet scary. And because you're reframing all of yourself in this entirely new context. But it taught me a lot about fear and faith. And it taught me a lot about who I'm choosing to be every single day. And the choices I made at that time really helped me get past that scared young girl to becoming a very successful person. I got to the top of my corporate career again in a few short years and learned everything that shaped my success in the business world. And just when I was at the height of success, you think, okay, I finally made it, right? I, I got past all these fears. Life is good. I'm crushing it and everything's going great. And then in 2008, you know, my life fell apart. I lost everything in the crash and also lost my partner to suicide. You know, I came home one day to a dead body and mm. it's hard to describe things even beyond the shock and the grief because so often, you know, that's exactly what happens to almost everyone, right? I mean, you, you think everything is smooth sailing. It's exactly finally you're at that point where life is good, it's stable, it's the certainty, and then something happens to you, you know, it's coming at you sideways, completely unexpected. And in that moment, most of us do fall apart. <laughs> the issue is not whether you know you were strong enough to withstand that or you fell apart, I think the key is who do you become in that moment? Because again, it's yet another obstacle that provides you an opportunity to become another version of yourself, unfold yet another layer. And for me, through that devastation, through that absolute sort of sense of loss and grief, it was very, very hard. I mean, I was paralyzed for you know a significant period of time where I did not have the desire to get out of bed. I stopped working. I was completely broke. And this is coming after success. So it's not that I was you know struggling. I went from struggling to successful, and then I went from successful to struggling again. Has anyone ever inspired you to discover a happier, healthier, and more fulfilled you? It is a magical experience, isn't it? Inspiration is indeed very powerful, yet it's often undermined. It can lift you from the ground to the sky in no time. Have you ever thought about returning the favor by inspiring the people around you? If you don't think you have it in you, we have good news for you. Art Costello's online course has everything you need to learn to supercharge yourself and shape your character into a powerful personality. Get ready to discover your strengths and unleash the creativity within. Don't believe it? Check it out yourself by signing up for this life-changing course at expectationacademy.com. That's expectationacademy.com. Yeah. 
you and I have so much in common with that because in 2006, I lost my wife of 38 years to ovarian cancer. And I went through a period of three years where I can't even, t well, for the first year, I can't tell you what, I don't know anything. I mean, I couldn't tell you who was at her funeral. My mind just shut down. Mm -hmm. But out of that, it took me three years and my kids slapping me upside the head and saying, dad, you promised your mom we were going to do this. But out of that, we rise up mm -hmm. or some people completely fold and just never recover and live in the past. I chose to honor my late wife by doing and living to my dream. And I lost everything financially also. And before that, I had everything. I had big house, cars, boat. I mean, the whole nine yards. I had the American dream. And I lost it all because paid off all the medical bills. And it left me pretty much having to start over. Yeah. But having faith over fear <laughs> and not letting the fear overcome me, I got up and started writing the book. And that's how expectation therapy came about. So I can identify with you on that. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, I think what you shared about in that moment of uh, complete loss and devastation, we really have two choices. We can either allow ourselves to experience that pain, learn from it and rise up from it, or we can let that pain and the fear hold us back and keep us there for the rest of our lives. And I do believe it is a choice. Because for a period of time, I did not think I could make, you know, I mean, I really did not. I remember so many days just laying in bed, not wanting to even step out of it, let alone go about my day and do anything productive. But I let the grief take its time. I did not want to escape mm -hmm. the grief. I didn't want to jump into addictions and distractions. I allowed myself to feel the pain. But I recall one fine day waking up and thinking, you know, happiness is a choice. And it's a choice I want to make today, just for today. I just want to choose to be happy. And it made me realize that happiness comes from hope. You know, none of us would be happy if we thought the world was ending and everything was over. You need some sort of hope. But hope comes from believing in something bigger than yourself, whether mm -hmm. that bigger thing is purpose or our creator or our children, our families, you have to believe in something bigger than yourself that gives you hope. And when you feel, have that in place, that's what makes us happy. And that led me on this quest of asking myself, what is that bigger purpose? And it was that collage that came back to mind of thinking, gosh, I'd forgotten about the collage, you know, because I've been so down and depressed, I'd forgotten about the collage. And that is my purpose of creating impact about, you know, becoming the best version of myself every single day and inspiring others to do the same. And I remember having that thought, having that vision, stepping out of my bed when my feet touched the ground and I stood up. I stood up with a deep sense of purpose and confidence and belief that got me going. And I've never looked back since then. It just started me on this journey. I got my life back in order, step by step, one little step after another. I went from being overwhelmed with the size of my problems, you know, feeling like, oh my gosh, this is a giant mountain climb. I don't even know where to begin. And instead of focusing on the big problems, I said, this is just the one step I need to take today. And bit by bit, I started going. I decided to launch my own business. I had this big purpose. I wanted to create impact and I launched my own company. I faced 300 rejections. I mean, it was just every single day thinking, gosh, somebody say yes. You know, but all I got <laughs> were no's. But because I had this bigger purpose, I did not give up. And so I kept going after it. I failed 11 times. But after the 12th time, I was on my way to success and very quickly built up this multi million dollar global company. And, you know, with big name clients from around the world, it was hugely successful. I won a ton of awards, got recognized as one of the top women entrepreneurs. And that journey also allowed me to create the impact I was uh, wanting to make. But it also gave me a different perspective on things. I realized so much that every step of the way, it was as if life was this video game that I'd started off at level one. 
with a set of tools and with a set of skills and a certain level of confidence. And then I faced these obstacles. As I was facing these obstacles, but not trying, I was stuck at the same level. But when I tried and I learned the strategies and the skills to overcome those obstacles, I would get to level two. But guess what happens at level two? Your problems just get bigger. Those (laughs) obstacles just get harder and bigger. And so you need new strategies, better skills, and even more confidence to overcome the challenges at level two. And then when you overcome that, you get to level three and your problems just get bigger. And as I looked back at that point, you know, I was at the pinnacle of success. As I was looking back, it became so clear to me that life gives us infinite levels, but we do have a set timer. It's as long as, you know, we're fortunate enough to live, that's our timer. The key to leveling up is to have the mindset that your obstacles are the opportunity to level up. And to constantly be a lifelong learner who's gaining new skills, who's developing a bigger perspective and a stronger mindset, and to keep enjoying that journey of leveling up. And when we do that, our greatest gifts and the possibilities are on the other side of that. And that perspective has been so incredibly empowering for me. You know, and that's what I'm on a mission to do now is to help women all over the world become future ready leaders. And, you know, when I look at the gender gap, 200 years to close the gender gap, that doesn't make any sense to me to think that, first of all, I don't have that kind of patience. (laughs) I don't want to wait 200 years. You know, why should women have to wait that long to rise up? And when you think about what's holding us back, you know, it's not so much about society or systemic bias. It's really that, you know, we have to dream bigger for ourselves. We have to develop the strategies and the skills, and we have to get future ready in order to become the kind of leaders that create impact. So my new company, Beyond Barriers, that's what we do. We help develop leaders of tomorrow by bringing in that kind of mindset, by developing those kind of skill set that allows women to, you know, not just survive, but to really thrive in this environment. I got a question for you. Do you think that it's gender specific? I mean, you talk about women, but I see men who are in the same situation and need the same help. Oh, absolutely. I don't believe it's gender specific at all. You know, while my company and my focus is specifically for things that might be more nuanced in terms of the types of strategies and skills that women might need, I think the challenge overall is a human problem, right? I mean, the the challenge of needing to level up, get past your fears, gain the skills, I think that's, that's a human element. See, that's my, my thing about it, because I don't believe that we can stop racism, yeah, homophobia, all of the things that are going on and so, so in the media now, when we look at things is in a gender-specific way, we need to start thinking of the human potential and the human cost of being negative or being downright nasty and mean and and everything. We need to see the cost of it, but we need to see it in a human way that is that takes in the whole big picture yeah. and changing the psyche of man. And I mean, man, in the sense of men and women, yeah. you know, my take on it is that as human beings, we're wired to fear differences. It's fight or flight, right? So from an evolutionary standpoint, we're wired to fear anything that is unknown or anyone that is different from us because we're trying to protect ourselves. But the power in appreciating someone else that's different from you, whether it's a different perspective or they look different or they believe in different things from you, is that it helps us grow. When we embrace someone else's difference, we also learn to embrace what's different about ourselves. And I think that's what really makes us shine. Learning. It's that goes back to that learning. When we are open-minded enough to see everybody's perspective and everybody's point of view, it adds a dimension to our learning that I think you're right, you know, that we we get so locked into my way or the highway and, and that kind of mentality that it really deters us from becoming who we have been meant to be. And I think that it's very destructive to the human element of who we really are. I mean, you know, you and I both know that when we limit who we talk to or who we see 
or who we associate with. I mean, it's proven if, if you put uh, multiracial kids together, you learn to live together faster than if you were just to be separated and not, you know, I mean, I think you've dealt with a whole lot of different issues. You know, you come from a different culture, you were gay, you know, you had different educational level than most. I mean, three master's degrees, you know, most Americans are lucky if they have one, you know? So, I mean, there's a lot of different things, but yet we're all the same. Mm -hmm. There's really no difference in us. It's what we've been taught and what we've let ourselves either learn or not learn. So I believe in this day and age, the greatest superpower is humility and curiosity. Because when we approach things from a place of humility and curiosity to want to discover and learn, you can navigate any environment. And, you know, we all know that because of technology and everything that's happening in the world right now, things are changing so fast. I mean, you know, companies are disappearing before our own eyes. You know, the nature of work is changing. Our way of life is changing. Cars that drive us, you know, speakers that listen to us and watches that tell us how healthy we are. I mean, it's, it's an entirely new world where change is happening so fast that it's almost impossible for us to adapt to that change quickly. But if we have a closed mind and we say, well, you know, that's for the next generation. It's not about me or my job is safe or my business is fine because that's not what we do. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a techie. That closed mindedness will disrupt us because we have to learn to be curious about this new world. We have to be humble enough to want to learn and to say, yes, what I know is based on what I've learned in the past, but what if I could learn something new? How does this work differently? And that is what allows us to disrupt ourselves before we get disrupted by something on the outside. I agree because, you know, I am at 72 and my computer skills I mean, I have taught myself, I'm self-taught on everything. And if I would have just said, use that word that I don't use in my vocabulary, which is can't, mm -hmm. you know, if I said I can't do it, well, then you're not. I mean, I think it was Henry Ford that said, you're right if you think you can and you're right if you think you can't. And that is the truth. When we get that mindset, and I think so many seniors need to hear what you just said, because they're put out to pasture it. It's getting less and less, 55, 60 years old now where, you know, you think that you're going to retire and the world's going to just stop. It doesn't. Yeah. And there is so much that they could teach other people. It would keep their minds active. It would keep their bodies active. And, you know, I just refuse to stop. I just won't do it. So Yeah, and, you know, what your attitude is exactly – you know, what's necessary for anyone at any age to have is to recognize we're not defined by a set retirement age. In fact, we are living longer and longer. You know, human beings now, in fact, the latest data, I believe, says that we will live well into our 90s. So the average retirement age has shifted to almost 70 now. Mm -hmm. So if that is the case, you still have, even post-retirement, you still have another 20 years to live. Would you just want to stay static, look into the past and say, that's when I used to be, you know, the high school quarterback, or that's when I used to be successful and look back at your old trophies and pictures? Or do you want to look forward and say, wow, I've got 20 years more of learning and growing and giving? And that's so powerful because as much as technology has become the dominant force in this day and age, and it's going to become even more so with things like artificial intelligence and robotics and you know, data taking over, but what the research has shown is that the number one most powerful skill that is going to shape humanity and is the key to success is actually empathy. It's our relational skills, our ability to relate to other people, our ability to understand them, and the creativity that emerges from that is going to create the leaders of tomorrow. So what a lot of people misunderstand and have misperceptions about, they think it's the digital age. It's all about technology. And so there's you know, the 22-year-old programmer and engineer that's going to dominate and run the world and robots are taking over when the truth is 
yes, there's an element of technology creating new experiences and products and services for us, but the people that will really thrive and contribute the most are the ones that have the emotional intelligence and <laughs> the communication skills for this new world. And that is exactly what we're teaching is that we're teaching the soft skills because we're not teaching engineering skills or coding skills. We're actually teaching the soft skills because that is the superpower. And when I think about anyone at any age, especially if it's someone that's nearing a retirement or in their retirement years, think about the gift you have to give of the wisdom and the experience that that actually makes you even more valuable to society instead of thinking, you know, the best years are behind you. Think of the best years ahead of you of what you have to contribute. Don't know which direction you want your life to take? Are you sinking deep down into the pit of uncertainties day by day? So, what's the secret to leading a happy, satisfied life? It's taking matters into your own hands. But what if the matters in question are a total blur? Art Costello's Expectation Academy course aims to tell you exactly how you can get some clarity in your life. This course can be your savior on your journey to reinventing yourself. While you certainly can't plan your whole future ahead, you can definitely control twists and turns your life takes. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for this course now at expectationacademy.com. Get a chance to broaden your horizons and add meaning to your life. That's expectationacademy.com. I think that, and this is honest from my heart, when I was nine years old and went to the top of that hill and asked, God, what was going to happen to me? What was going to become of me? And I heard a voice that just said, your job to just do, just get out and do and just be faithful and be good. And that propelled me my entire life to do what I've done. I mean, it's always, you had your collage. I had that vision in my head and that's what's driven me. And, you know, when you said about emotional intelligence is huge because I teach emotional intelligence also to my clients and the people that I work with because I believe it is a skill that can be learned and it is so important. If you can't identify your emotions and act on them intelligently, you really, no matter what age you are, you're lost. Yeah. And we, we need so much more of it. I have something to ask you that is kind of off, but it's on my list and I want to get it in because I want to hear your comments on this. When you lost your partner in 2008, did you ever think you'd love again? No, I did not. I didn't either. Yeah. And that's what I meant about the loss of hope. Mm -hmm. In fact, I did not want to live again, forget about love again. It was such a confusing time for me because I felt guilt, I felt shock, I felt anger, I felt a deep sense of loss and grief. So, you know, the seven stages of grief, I mean, I went through all of that. Absolutely. Not knowing, I mean, I didn't know the intellectual framework of it, but I absolutely experienced it. And then I got to the point where I just felt numb. I I stopped feeling, that was actually the scariest of all. In Mm -hmm. some ways, feeling something, no matter what the emotion is, at least allows you to feel alive. You know, when we feel pain or sadness, it's a good sign. It means we're alive. But when you stop feeling anything, it's a scary time. And that's when I stopped wanting to live. Isn't it beautiful to love again, though? Because I found love again, and I know you found love again. And I think for me, I can't speak for anyone else, but I can speak for me. The second time for me has been so much more gratifying because I had the experience of loving the first time. Yes. And it's just amazing how that works. And I want the audience to know that if you've lost a loved one or if you're in a situation of a breakup, you will love again if you let yourself and if you make that choice to love again when the time is right. And it will be so much more powerful. I found that the reason I was not only able to find love again, but find, you know, a really powerful kind of love is because in losing, you know, the love of my life the first time, it taught me a lot about myself. It gave me an opportunity to learn so much about who I am, what I really want, why I really want it, and 
that clarity about yourself allows you to love and accept all of you. And when we come from a place of wholeness where we are complete and you love yourself, then you naturally attract the kind of love that is wholesome, the kind of love and relationship that is good for you, good for your soul, and allows you to give to someone else because your own cup is full. When we try to find relationships or love because we're trying to fill something that is incomplete on the inside or that we don't fully love ourselves, so we need the validation of someone else telling us that they love us for us to feel good about who we are and you know, it's our sense of self-worth when it's not enough. That feeling of I'm not enough, I won't be loved is, you know, doesn't allow us to have the kind of relationships and the kind of love that we all deserve. So for me, that period of loss and grief and pain gave me an opportunity to love myself, frankly, to learn to love myself, all of me, all parts of me, accept myself fully. And as I healed and came into being, for the first time, I actually enjoyed my own company. I didn't feel like I needed to be with someone. And I remember kind of looking at myself in the mirror one day and just with a big beaming smile saying, oh my gosh, I'm freaking awesome. (laughs) (laughs) I love me. But you are awesome. (laughs) You are awesome. But being able to say that and not because I was practicing some kind of confidence skill. I mean, it just kind of came out, you know, it's like looking at yourself saying, I love myself. And that feeling of completeness of saying, wow, this is an amazing place to be. And when you radiate that joy and we radiate that self-love and that self-worth and self-esteem, are really deep and true, you just attract people to your life, friends, family, colleagues, lovers, you know, I mean, they just come to you because that light is a magnet that brings similar kind to you. It radiates from within and permeates outside of you. It's like an aura or a glow about you. People can always identify people that love themselves. I mean, you just see it. You look at that somebody sometimes, I can be going through the airport and I'll see somebody and they just radiate and I'll say, there's somebody that's got it. They know it. (laughs) And a positive mindset and the expectation that we have of ourselves and our expectation of our life experiences, I really believe is so influential in what creates that glow from within yeah, and, and what I mean by expectation is actually, you know, I found that when I shed expectation of something that I needed to fit into based on someone else's vision or someone. That's you know, the key. Yeah. When it's somebody else's expectation, right? you need to shed it. <laughs> yeah. When you shed that expectation of trying to please someone or being good enough for someone or being better than someone, when you shed all of those expectations and it simply becomes you know, goes from expectation, turning your expectations into appreciation. Uh, And I believe Tony Robbins says that, and which is, I think, such a powerful line of you go from, you know, feeling inadequacy to feeling absolute gratitude. Gratitude became the ultimate game changer for me. And that inner glow and that inner confidence came from a place of gratitude. When I stopped thinking about what I lacked, and felt gratitude for what I had and who I am and who I'm constantly becoming each day and for the people in my life and the experiences, even the worst horrible experiences, feeling gratitude that happened to me, that became the absolute game changer. And that gratitude is what creates the glow. I agree. You know, I think one of the things with me, because I do so much research with expectations and everything, I think it's the most misunderstood and misinterpreted word in the English language, you know, I just have a whole different take on expectations and how they really affect our whole being. Because I think you heard me at the Media Summit when I ended my pitch there, and I said that everything starts and stops with an expectation. And it's a truth. It really does. If you put some thought into it, it's true. And how, because the three tenets of expectation therapy are identify, clarify, and solidify with a written plan. Mm. And, you know, it's just about managing these expectations because we have so many every day. We have 
expectations of breathing and eating. And we don't even think about those, you know, and we have expectations in relationships. We have societal expectations. You have to stop red lights, stop signs, all of those. I mean, we have millions a year of expectations. And if you don't learn how to manage them, boy, I think the greatest skill we can teach our children is teach them to manage their expectations and how to do it. And we'll be doing the world the biggest favor ever. But that's my take on it. I wanted to ask you something else in regards to love. Mm -hmm. Can you give me your definition of love? Mm. (laughs) That's a great question. To me, love is making someone feel, loving someone their way, you know, because it's a practice to be able to do that. Making someone feel love their way and being able to receive it your way. So I see it as absolute vulnerability in many ways, shedding the expectation of who we think we need to be in order to be loved (laughs) and shedding the expectation of how we need to show up for someone else. So the deepest kind of love to me is, you know, kind of self-love that allows you to be completely naked in our expectations, right? So, you know, that is what I have found to be so incredibly powerful is being able to give without expectations and being able to receive without expectations. That's good. I kind of have a simpler thing. I break down things simply and I kind of call love the unconditional surrender of your spirit to the spirit of someone else. Mm, That's a beautiful way of saying it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because it it is, you know, you have to surrender. Yeah. I mean, whether you're a person of faith or whatever your beliefs are, if you don't surrender to the will of God, then, you know, you got a problem. If you don't surrender to the will of your mate, you've got a problem. So there's a, a certain part of you that has to surrender, but yet not lose who you are, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's where my view of expectations is different than the rest of the world's because I believe the one thing that man can hold on to and no one can take away is how we expect Mm. because that is the one thing that we can control and it controls and radiates everything else out of us love, success, all of those things radiate from that. And I just have a different view of how it all works. So yeah, I I think what you said about surrender is, you know, exactly what I was trying to say is that being able to let go without letting the fear of being judged or not accepted, or, Mm -hmm. you know, whether how someone else feels about you, and just being able to give And surrender to how it unfolds, you know, and and who you keep becoming in that relationship. And it's not just in romantic relationships, but love even in the context of how we relate to each other. That surrender is incredibly powerful. See, I think that judgment is the most destructive thing Mm -hmm. in a relationship, in a business. I mean, when people start judging and comparing and doing all those things, it is a signal that there is something wrong with the culture or the marriage or however you want to look at it. But doesn't judgment begin with the self though? Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that people who are extremely judgmental of themselves are judgmental of everything else. But I think that that's where the surrender to understand that life, there's only certain things that we can control our expectations being one of them, everything else, we really have no control over anybody else. So don't give them control over you. And when you start living to who you are, and you've got to do this with integrity and with class and skills, mm-hmm. that, like you talked about skills. I mean, you just can't go out helter skelter and think that the world is going to work. Yeah. It doesn't. It, there's got to be structure to it. And there's got to be skill sets and all that. So I think that when we do that and we surrender to it and understand, it's having an understanding with an open-mindedness to the possibilities of anything's possible. I mean, anything is possible in this life if we believe that it's possible. If we believe that it's not, not going to happen. 
that's my take on on that. But you know, I wanted for you to just briefly, if you can, tell us what you've accomplished. I know we used to have a business and all that, but you really have accomplished great things at a very young age. Most people don't accomplish what you've accomplished into 45s, 50s, 60s, and here you are in your 30s and just (laughs) knocking it dead. (laughs) Thank you, Art. I appreciate that. So for me, like I mentioned, the analogy of the video game, it's really been a journey that's reflective of that kind of mindset is, you know, growing up with so few resources in India, which was a third world nation at the time, I was surrounded by poverty. And yet at the same time, I saw you know, some of the poorest people with big smiles on their faces and living a life of joy. And it taught me that it's not about what we have externally or around us, it's who we believe we are and how we feel about ourselves that shapes our experience of life. And it was incredible to grow up in that culture, you know, where it's about surrender and it's about taking action, you know, just doing. So that attitude. So even though I came to America with almost nothing, I was able to have that mindset of it's not about what I have on the outside. It's who I'm becoming each day and how I give, how I contribute and how I keep learning that shapes me and shapes my life experience. So I was able to translate that into tremendous success in my corporate career, rose to the top of big corporations, was an advisor to some of the biggest companies around the world, helped them become more innovative. So in fact, our tagline was, we make elephants run. So helping the biggest companies become more effective and innovative to building multiple businesses, built six companies so far. And, you know, each of them has gotten bigger and more successful. So becoming one of the top female entrepreneurs and building this multi-million dollar company, it was a little bit like winning the Olympics because so few other women showed up. And it, it gave me a perspective on really the things that hold us back, right? From dreaming bigger, from being even bolder, from taking action and from not giving up. And that really led to my current focus, which is about creating the leaders of tomorrow. You know, how do we help young people become you know, future ready leaders, because the world needs more leadership. The world mm-hmm. needs people that are driven to create social impact, that are driven to do good in the world and are fearless in the pursuit of that mission. So my organization Beyond Barriers is, you know, on this global mission to inspire, to educate, to empower young people to become, you know, future ready leaders. So I'm you know, privileged to not only let my journey unfold of the person that I am today and the person I continue to become, but it's a deep sense of responsibility to be able to contribute forward and to help more people achieve the same. With that being said, Nikki, where can everybody get a hold of you? Well, I would love to invite your audience to get a free copy of my book, Beyond Barriers. So you can go to nikkibarua.com forward slash free. And, uh, you know, get a copy of my book, uh, which talks about how to go beyond barriers and unlock your limitless potential and how gaining the clarity, developing the courage and having the conviction to stay the course is really the key to each of us becoming the limitless beings that we were born to be. So I'd love to have everyone, you know, get a copy of the book, share what you think, connect with me and stay in touch. Nikki, it has been an absolute pleasure. You know that I just love you to death. You're such (laughs) a good person. And with that being said, we're going to sign off. It's been a really fast hour. I couldn't believe that it went so fast. I want to have you back on sometime because we've got a lot more. I have a notepad here full of questions that I didn't get to ask. But with that being said, uh, everybody, you know where you can get a hold of me, expectationtherapy.com, Art Costello, And thank you. And Heather White, take us out of here. Thanks for listening to the show. Drop us your comments and questions with what you want answered on the show. You can subscribe on iTunes and Binge Network. You can also get more information on the website, expectationtherapy.com.